Thanks very much. Um, I was looking for a title for this presentation uh, and I was struggling. Georgina, the organisers, uh, was putting me under some pressure. So I suddenly thought of the word becoming. I thought, well, if someone can sell 10 million books with worth I mean, maybe I'll better get a decent Now here I am with my wife. She's the one on the far right. <laughs> and uh, we were introduced to Michelle Obama eight at a time. And in front of me, this was in Copenhagen, by the way, in front of me were these really tall, this really tall couple. You know, I wanted to call them Great Danes, but they were sort of six and a half foot, foot each. And uh, for those of you who watch Game of Thrones, one of them looked like Brienne of Tarth. And uh, anyway, as they approached Michelle Obama, she said, at last, normal-sized people. <laughs> and yeah, it made me feel like Tyrion Lannister when it was my turn to go up and say hello. So uh, I think you know who I am. I'm not going to spend very much time introducing myself. Um, and, you know, and some of you know about the, my performance as an ISA investor. And the key point I want to bring out here is that had we put in the full amount of our allowed allowance each year from 1993, we'd have invested, my wife and I, who's not Michelle Obama, would have invested 560,000 pounds. And had we put that in an index tracking fund, and let's assume no costs for that index tracker, that, that fund would now be worth just shy of 1.4 million, so a return of 7.85% per annum. So, you know, it would be possible, if you have duration of time, a reasonable return, making the full use of the allowance and not getting divorced, it would be possible to become at least a nicer millionaire couple. But we had burdens or, uh, or demands on our finances. You know, I had two daughters at private school, a mortgage. You're earning less when you're in your 30s and your 40s than you do later on. We only put 54% of our money into our ISA, so around 300,000. So it's about 255 less than I might have been able to do so. Um, and the consequence of that, we'll come on to see. Um, we've, uh, I've generated a return of just under 19% per annum since 1993. And since 2003, I've not had a down year in my ISA. So uh, performance has improved at 21 and a half. We'll see whether it reverts to mean over the next few years. And I've managed to beat the FTSE All Share, and that's on a dividends reinvested basis, 19 times out of the last 26. And over the last couple of weeks, I've actually gone ahead of that uh, index for the current year. So hopefully, it'll be 20 times out of 27 years. So what does that mean overall for my ISA? And I, thanks to Mr. English, who spoke yesterday, I've now got this new graphic, which opens up and presents my ISA performance. The yellow bars show what the maximum cumulative contribution has been since 93, had I made that. And the brown bars show what we actually put in. And as you'll see, in this period here, we weren't investing very much money. In fact, we took out about 10,000 pounds around this time, around 03. Um, the gray shows what our funds would have been worth had I put them into a FTSE All Share Tracker. So the brown would have turned into the grey, about 700,000. And you can see we've done significantly better than that. Became an ISA millionaire in 2013. And you know, things have done very nicely. Uh, however, had we made the full contribution to our ISAs in this period here, the fund would be rather larger than this. In fact, it would be worth 9.7 million pounds. So for saving that £255,000 in those middling years has cost me £6 million. Now, my, I have presented this to my daughters, <laughs> and they're rather hoping for a bear market because it, takes, it will take some of the pressure away from them. Uh, because, uh, but, but it does tell the point, doesn't it, over and over again, that compounding, especially where you can compound tax-free, is vital and that you need to be able to save as much as you can as early as you can. So I presented to Accenture, some young people at Accenture last week, aged between 20 and 30, and I got the feeling, you know, these millennials were looking at me and thinking, well, it's all right for this baby boomer. He's been lucky, look, 
you know, returns have been pretty good since 1993. We've had, you know, the explosion of world trade, which is obviously potentially going to reverse. Uh, and the, this has been great for equity markets, and you're just a lucky bugger. So I look back at the performance of the Dow. Now, oh, sorry, the S&P 500. And most of this data I'm going to introduce to you is, is U.S. because the U.S. has the longest continuous uh, sort of uh, market data that's uh, available. Now, had I invested, or sorry, had someone invested. $100 way back in 1928 or at the end of 1927, that $100 would have compounded at 9.49% per annum and would at the end of 18, 2018 have been worth $382,000. Absolutely spectacular performance. And it's worth saying that that performance was despite the Wall Street crash of 1929, the Great Depression that followed, World War II, in fact, investors who invested in 28 didn't really make much money until just prior to the 1950s. And then we've had the major stock market crashes of 74, the oil uh, shock, the 87 uh, crash, the 2000 dot-com bubble, and the 2008 credit crisis. So we've had you know, remarkably turbulent times, and yet equities have found a way to win, and they've won very big. Now, you might... You're often told, uh, particularly, I was here for, on Wednesday with the Mellow Funds and Trusts, and you know, there were advisors there saying that people of my age should be shifting 25% of my income, or 30%, of, sorry, of my equities in, into bonds, because they're judged to be safe, safer. And you know this cookie-cutter cut, approach to advice that a lot of IFAs use. You, know, you mark down whether you're a risk-taker or whether you're cautious and they'll always provide some bond allocation. Now, bonds have actually returned over this period, 1928 to 2018, just over half of the value of the 9.49. So they've generated a compounded return of 4.6%. That's the 10-year Treasury bond in the US. Now, I'd like everyone, if you'll help me, to put your hands up. Don't be shy, just put your hands up. Come on, don't be shy. Come on. And what I want you to do is put your hands down when I come up with an estimate of the compounded value of those Treasury bonds today. So let's start. That, think about the $100 then and use the information you've got here. Has that $100 invested in long-term Treasury bonds in the US, sorry, 10-year Treasury bonds, would it be worth $10,000 today or less? Anyone putting their hands down? A couple have put their hands down. Would it be worth $30,000 or less? A few more have gone down here. How about $60,000 or less? So quite a few dropped here. And how about $100,000? Has anyone still got their hands up? Well, one person at the back. <laughs> right. I, I promise uh, I won't make you stand up afterwards, OK? <laughs> so let's look at the value of $100 invested in 10-year Treasury bonds compounding at 4.8% since 1928. Can anyone actually see the brown here? <laughs> and that represents just $7,000. There were two people, I think, who put their hands down at less than $10,000. Would you like to put your hands up now, those two people? Hang on a minute. <laughs> There's about 15 people here with their hands up. <laughs> OK, but of course, there are times when investing in bonds makes a lot of sense. In fact, if you look at 10-year rolling periods, so 1928 to 1937, 1929 to 1939, or all the way here, 19, uh, 2009 to 2018, there were actually 81 10-year rolling periods. And in 11 of those 10-year periods, bonds actually outperformed equities. So, you know, I know what you're saying. You're saying, look, it's all very well and good, Leon, you know, I'm 50 years old. I haven't got 90 years on this planet. What are you talking about? And in fact, there's no 10-year-olds in the audience, as far as I can see, so with a life expectancy of 100. So there's very little risk or opportunity for someone to benefit from, the, from equities over a long period of time. I mean, even Warren Buffett didn't start investing until the early 40s. So let's think in a more manageable time periods. Let's think in 30-year periods. So here we have the rolling 30-year periods from 1928 to 2018. 
So the first period is 28 to 58, 29 to 59, and so, so on and so forth, all the way here, 1988 to 2018. And what it shows is that actually, this is for investments again in the S&P 500, that the minimum return was 10 times your money over 30 years. And if you were lucky uh, to have invested in 19... 1940, uh, 1967, 1960, uh, 1973 or four, you'd have made 45 times your money. Now, uh, that might be great, but some of you will be saying, hang on a minute, I've heard of Japan. And in fact, I had two friends who, in the 80s, they were involved in the equities market. They were really excited about Japan. I mean, let's remember, Japan had gone up sixfold in the 1980s, the Nikkei 225. So both of them liked Japanese equities. They also liked Japanese women. So they headed off to live in Tokyo. And, you know, and if I asked you to put a, a marker down on this graph almost to the month that they went to live in Japan, I bet most of you would find it. In fact, the market there peaked at 30, just under 39,000, uh, on the 29th of December 1989. It's never been at that, nev never been even close to that peak ever since, and it's now standing at 21,000 or so. Uh, and that represents a 40% decline. And if one factors in dividends reinvested, well, it's still a 15% decline over those 30 years, and we're not, we haven't even discussed inflation. You know, so the real loss there is very significant. So my poor mate's whole career as equity analysts, have been defined by a bear market. I mean, how miserable can that be? But remember, in 1989, there was lots of headlines about the Nikkei being worth more than the American stock markets. The land around the Imperial Palace was valued at more than uh, the entire estate market, real estate market in California. So we've got to be thinking, when we hear lots of headlines about the fangs, you know, are we at that point now in, in our... In, uh, where value, too much value has been ascribed to too, too much price has been ascribed to too little value. Now, investing is a tricky business, and Hendrik Bessenbinder has done this research. It's been mentioned at numerous investor conferences I've been to. It's only an initial report. The final bit of uh, analysis comes out later this year. And he found that only 4% of the 25,000 companies that have been listed on one or other of the US markets, only 4% of those companies have actually contributed towards the net wealth creation, which he estimated at $35 trillion that has arisen in America between 1926 and 2016. So just under 1,100 companies have generated a lifetime gains, and that's an important point to mention, lifetime gains over their entire cycle on the stock market, that have exceeded the one-month treasury bills, which from memory over that period is, has been around 3.2% or something like that. And if we look closer at the data, only five companies have accounted for 10% of the total wealth creation, including names that we know quite well, Apple and Microsoft and IBM. And 90 companies have accounted for more than 50%. And in fact, only a minority have actually generated a positive return at all, and that's ignoring whether they've exceeded, that, that's, that's just an absolute return, not whether they've beaten the, uh, the one-month uh, treasury bills. So how as investors do we access and find our way to the best 4%? Because that really is our challenge. Do we go to a fund manager? Well, here is that chart I showed you earlier with a... 382,000 pounds invested. Now, had we employed a fund manager that charged us 1%, or a fund whose total charges were 1%, might be a better way of describing it, we wouldn't have had 382,000, we'd have lost half of it. So that 1% difference in return, that's why here we're returning 8.49%, not the 9.49%, would have halved our returns. And more realistically, if we take in the management fee and the other costs of running a fund, Actually, our, our returns would be $106,000. So, you know, maybe a fund isn't the right way to go. And of course, people will say, look, there's been this massive growth in passive investing. What's the evidence there? Well, look at the evidence here. 
Uh, the S&P, uh, sorry, Standards and Poor's produce a biannual uh, review of the performance of fund managers, and they do that across a whole lot of different countries. I've only focused on the U.S. here, and a, across a whole range of different types of funds. And what they've shown is that in the U.S., over a 15-year period, only 3.3 percent of small cap funds beat the relevant index, which is listed in that second column. And the best they got to was 9.3 percent for multi-cap funds. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is this: index funds don't provide average performance; they give the investor top decile returns. And that really was quite mind-blowing for me because I don't know if any of you take part in the UK Stock Challenge competition uh, that about 500 private investors participate. It's quite difficult to get in the top 10 and to do so uh, consistently. Uh, this is a, a quote from Professor Burton Malkiel. He was the author of the most successful investing book of all time, *A Random Walk on Wall Street*, which was written in the 1970s and was one of the very first to make the case for index investing. And he went on to become a director of non-exec director of Vantage, um, which is, is the biggest player in that market. Now, that in the U.S., passives are massive: 6.7 trillion of assets. Held in, in passive funds, or 35 percent of the market. I mean, that gives them huge economies of scale. We think Fundsmith is big at 17 billion under management. These funds are running into hundreds of billions, which means that costs are super low. Look, just seven basis points. And of course, we've heard a lot about momentum investing. And even though I don't like it, it does work. You know, there is a clear behavioural bias. In favour of momentum investing, and one of the best ways of capturing it, arguably, is passive investing. And of course, passive funds are very Darwinian. The bad companies go out, the good companies go into the index. And of course, rather than own the individual stocks and be buying and selling and incurring capital gains tax, it's a great way of growing tax-free, at least to the point when you actually come to sell. The shares, and the other thing about passing investing is it avoids many of the behavioural biases that condemn us and professional fund managers to often average performance. So, is this the end of active investing? Well, I hope not, because otherwise I'll have to tell David to cancel the next Mellow show, and we, we all give up.、Uh, well, if you exclude closet trackers.、Uh, Then actually, research shows the performance of active fund management managers is not so bad.、Um, and also, we've got this issue about the whole price discovery process. You know, if if there's if it's, it's essentially backwards looking, I I'm going to buy this share because Leon Boros has bought it, or Warren Buffett has bought it, or or, or John Lear has bought it. Then we're not basing it on our own. Estimation of the company, we are looking essentially backwards, and is that a good way of allocating capital in any system? In fact, a very respected U.S. brokerage has said that the danger of the growth of passive investing could be the collapse of capitalism, because actually, central planning Marxist style is actually、uh, could be more efficient than a backwards allocation, backwards-looking allocation of capital. You know, be Jeremy Corbyn could get everything he wants without even having to be elected. So. There's also the issue of what happens when momentum reverses. Some argue that that's when stock pickers will come into the fore. But actually, the research, the research rather from S and P, from Spiva, shows that actually stock pickers don't do any better in sideways or down markets. And of course, a lot of fund managers have decided to focus their attention on their best ideas, high conviction kind of funds. And certainly, if you look at Fundsmith, that's an example of that. And we've had Blue Well here a few days ago, who again are, are sort of adopting that approach.、Uh, and it gives an investor、uh, the best chance to skew their returns in favour of their best ideas. So, you know, the challenge for me, and I think the challenge for all of us, is how do we find our way? We don't want to go down the index route or the fund management route. How do we find our way to the best returns that are available? And I've previously spoken about two approaches that come together very neatly. One is effective money management, and the other one is picking good stocks. Now, I've spoken at length in the past about quality companies and what that represents,、uh, and I want to just remind you of a talk I gave last year about. Effective money management,、um, and it was in part based on. I'm 
just have a sip of water, on the book here, The Art of Execution. Now, this book was written by Lee Freeman Shaw. I was told that there was going to be quite a lot of new people in the audience, so apologies to those people who came last year. There will be a bit of repetition. Uh, it's a very simple and easy to read book. You can read it in a couple of sessions. And in terms of investment ideas, you're getting more I good ideas per page of reading or per pound of cost than you will in any other book that you'll read. And essentially, uh, Old Mutual decided to launch a best ideas fund, and they retained the best 45 investors in the world. And this included the likes of uh, Chris O'Day. Some might question whether he's one of the best 45 investors in the world, but nonetheless, uh, each of these investors was allocated capital of between 20 million and 150 million. Dollars. And then Freeman Shaw analyzed the results. And what was remarkable was that 49% of the investments, there were just under 1,900 investments, actually lost money. But these professional investors were very good at something else. They were very good at protecting their capital. Only 7% lost more than 4%. Sorry, only 7% of all investments lost more than 40%. And only 1% of investments lost more than 80% of. Uh, the investment. And what Freeman Shaw decided to do was to characterize or describe uh, five investor tribes, three of which he associated with this question that we all have to answer regularly. I'm losing. What on earth should I do? And there were two investor tribes <coughs> which he associated with the nice problem of I'm winning. What should I do? Now, I haven't got time to sort of go into the detail I did last year. And if you want to have a look at the behavioral biases, for instance, that afflict rabbits, there's a, if you go into PI World, you'll be able to pull up my presentation from last year. And there's a, quite a, a lot of detail there. Or indeed, go and buy the book from the stand if they still have any available uh, out in, in the main causeway. But essentially, when faced with choices of, uh, on a losing investment, the rabbits did nothing. They were caught in the headlights, and there's a whole range of behavioral biases that explains that, not least anchoring on the price that they paid. And then there were the assassins, who were very good at getting out, selling, and then the hunters, who on a selective basis took the opportunity of buying more shares. Uh, now, you've got to be very careful with that, because I've seen more money lost that way than uh, in any other. You know, people have this idea that if they bought at two pounds, the shares are now a pound, that if they double up, their average in price has dropped to 150. They're getting closer psychologically to the price that they uh, paid. And that carries on all the way down. So when the shares are 2p, they're buying millions of the damn things now to bring their average in price to 5p. And they think, if I could just get that 3p back, I'll be back to where I started. Sadly, as Carillion and all those other disasters, blow-ups, show it rarely works. But hunters think through this carefully in advance of uh, making uh, even their first investment and will often keep money to one side to buy in at lower levels should the share price drift down. So I've shown this chart before. It's the, I've now called it the Assassin's Creed. Uh, and it, it's a simple lesson, but it's worth repeating over and over again. You know, if I've taken a 20% loss on a share, and I use the proceeds to reinvest in something else, I only need to make 25% on the next investment to get my money back. But if I let things drift, and you know, I know it's easy to do, you know, suddenly you're down at minus 75, minus 90%, you're having to three times your money on your next investment, or nine times your money on, on, on a 90% loss. And you know, how many times have any of us had 10 baggers in this room? You, know, you can count them on, a hand, on one hand. So raiders, uh, the kind of show me the money people, these are the people who uh, don't necessarily deal with winning in the right way. Um, they take their profit as soon as they possibly can. And the remarkable piece of ev uh, information from this book is that these great investors, the 45 top managers in the world, 66% of all the winning stocks were sold for a gain of less than 20%. Now that is truly, truly remarkable. It was hard enough finding those winners. They found 900 winners, and on, on two-thirds of the occasion, they got out after making just 20 percent. And of those ones that they sold, 60 percent kept going up. 
And that included some very, very big winners. And the key point is that all successful investors, you know, John Lee's no exception, I'm no exception, have one thing in common. They have the presence of some truly big winners. Now, last year, uh, I asked some behavioral questions. I think I asked nine. They, if you want to see all of them, you can go on the PI website and see the presentation that I did. But I think the one that uh, stuck, it, stuck in my mind the most was these questions, which uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, the famous psychologist and the kind of inventor of, uh, or certainly the influencer of behavioral economics, he, he designed. Uh, now, this is a, a bet that is offered to investors. And it's the choice between £8,000 for certain or this gamble, where they have an 85% chance of winning £10,000, but a 15% chance of losing the lot. And the expected value of number two is 8500 so it's more than the guaranteed bet. But 73% of the Mellow audience, and there was a decent sample here, 104 people, they chose the, the safety route. Now, at that same presentation, I asked people to put their net worth down, and actually it was pretty impressive. The net investing worth of the audience was over a million pounds. So that 8,000 pounds didn't really matter to them. When I asked this question at Accenture, where the average savings of those young people was about 15,000, 8,000 matters a lot. They would definitely go for that 8,000. So what's happening here is that effectively, we're being cautious when we're winning. You know, the, if we repeatedly make decisions based upon grabbing the 8,000 for certain ra rather than the, running the statistically likely 8,500, we're going to be progressively, over time, making bad bets which will affect our performance. Now, I flipped this question around. Now, for those in the audience, you might remember, I asked what happens if you're making a loss, 8,000 pounds for certain, but you're given a chance of wiping that loss. It's only a 15% chance, but you're given a chance nonetheless. However, associated with that opportunity is an 85% chance of losing everything. What did our very prudent, sensible, mellow investors do? Well, they took the gamble, of course. You know, they were prepared to take more risk when losing. And when I asked this, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've, we have learned a thing or two. All the gray hair in the audience has been for a reason. You know, we have, we have improved over the years. Now, the young people at Accenture, I think, voted 91% in favor of taking the gamble. And they're highly educated young people, but their natural tendency was to take the gamble. Even though their average savings were only 10 to 15,000 pounds, they would take the risk and potentially lose 10,000. So, you know, in some ways, if we have that mindset, we have this kind of distribution of return. So raiders are often rabbits when they come to losing. And if you combine the two, it's fatal. And those guys end up with no big winners, Lots of small winners, lots of small losers, and a few big losers. And it's those few big losers that in the end kills them, and the absence of the big winners out to the right. But I want you to remember that diagram, because I'm going to compare it to another one in a moment. Now, the connoisseurs, these were the guys we want to be, and in truth, probably very few of us are. They were actually quite poor at stock picking. Only 60%, 60 of their ideas lost money. So they were only right 40% of the time, but when they won, they won big, they rode their winners, and they used top slicing as a way of dealing with instant gratification to deal with that psychological problem of, of the fear of losing. So why run your winners? Well, winners keep winners. Good things happen to good companies, and bad things happen to bad companies, and we've seen that. This is the rarity value. You know, don't give away a potentially winning lottery ticket. These things are hard enough to find. We've seen the Bessenbinder research, only 4% of those companies created value over the long term. So when you find one, hold it. And then there's the house money effect. This is, I've done really well here, so I'm going to sell in a good company, and I'm going to now, because I'm such a genius, start putting the money out to various other places, and, and you end up using what, you, in your own mind, is the casino's money to speculate with. You know, you sell Biomentix and, and you buy Viserion. <laughs> So I realized they won a whole lot of awards yesterday, so it's a bad joke because I'm likely, it's not likely to go down with the audience. Uh, and of course, can you ever really predict a big winner? I knew Biaventix would be a, big win a winner for me. I thought maybe it would get to a value of about 15 pounds. It went on to 40 pounds, and profits and the business have done a lot better than I could have ever anticipated. So I took the stats, and I, I do spend a lot of time looking at the past, you know, and, and measuring my performance. And I think 
you know, it, it's very useful because the human brain, it, it, and my brain in particular, is very poor at recalling uh, the truth and the past. You know, it all becomes a bit mashed in your brain in terms of what price you paid for a share and how much you made or lost. And it's wonderful to go back and actually see what happened in, in reality. Uh, sometimes it, it's quite a difficult exercise. You know, it's emotionally traumatic to look at some of your losses and to relive them and when you made all these terrible mistakes. But it's very helpful because it does help to ground you. Um, so I've had, uh, over 26 years, only 57% of my investments have been winners. Uh, now that's uh, around, uh, quite a, I've had a number of hedges on the FTSE All Share uh, over the years. In fact, 80% of those have been losing bets, but it has allowed me to hold my investments on the long side. Uh, if I ignore the hedges, I'm up at around 63%. Now, it's 172 investments, not many over a 26-year period. Um, and like the professional investors, I've managed to keep my losses pretty low. 8.7% of my investments ran up a loss of more than 40%, and only 1.2% of my investments lost more than 80%. I've never had a complete wipeout on any stock in my ISA, although I have had a couple outside of my ISA. But the key point is this, that even though my hit rate was only 57%, when I measure it by value, 86% were winners. And what that is telling us is that I was able to run profits and cut losses. I wasn't necessarily the greatest stock picker in the land. I mean, you know, Warren Buffett would be well into 90% here. And although, you know, people say you should be patient and hold for the long term, we also have to recognize our limitations as investors, you know, and we, we, we're not likely to be in the 90% hit rate. And therefore, in some ways, it's better to, 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 to cut a loss uh, at, because we have a natural aversion to taking losses. If we can overcome that, then you know, that will save us most of the time, even if, because our hit rate is unlikely to be it, it, brilliant. And the biggest winners are here, uh, ranging from by the date when I first got involved. Um, and there's an example here of Capita, a classic example where I made a lot of money on it. However, it's not proved to be an arrow like Unilever, starting and just compounding over the years. It was more like a hill. You know, it reached its peak value, but then declined now to a tenth of its original value, which shows us why the Bessenberg, Bessenbinder effect happens effectively, because over a lifetime of an investment, a lot end up going, don't create much value. So I looked at my winners and I created this table. Um, this looks at the distribution. Uh, it starts off there with minus 50. Um, now, my biggest loss is 53,000 on any investment. And you can see that I've had quite a few small losers, slightly more small winners. But I've got this long tail to the right, not huge in number, but sufficient to shift this graph in a very different way and direction to the graph I showed you earlier. Now, my winning investment, best investment's been Biobentix, so you know, the chart would have gone off on the screen here. But there's been a good number within this sort of 100,000 to 300,000 area. So what are the conclusions of this? And then I'm going to come and talk to you about one particular stock idea. So invest, invest as much as you can early and use ISIS because that provides you with the chance to tax-free uh, tax compound. Index track, if you want the market return, then go for an index tracker. By and large, you're going to get it. Why take the risk of going via a fund manager? That said, there can be opportunities and reasons to invest in a fund manager. You know, I, I track my performance against a number of fund managers who run quite concentrated portfolios. They're all doing better than the FTSE 100 all share with dividends to reinvest in. So you can get better returns. And of course, avoid closet, closet indexes. There's just loads of them. And they're really, I've, I've increasingly come to the view they're only set up to provide an opportunity for IFAs to direct money towards big investment companies where you get stodgy returns. Uh, and if you are going to invest in directly in shares, choose good companies which can enjoy and sustain better average economics and where those above average economics can last for as long as possible. And small caps offer real potential because the price discovery process doesn't work as well. You know, the funds that operate at this level might have 300 shares in a portfolio. The fund manager simply doesn't have the time to understand each and every one. Their, their knowledge, knowledge is an inch deep and a mile wide. 
and we have a chance of going in much deeper, understanding those companies better, and achieving better returns. We've discussed effective money management, uh, and I do believe whether we're a fund manager or whether the private investors is if focusing on your best ideas makes sense. You know, if if you have a large portfolio, you're mimicking a fund. Why not just invest in a fund and go on the beach or play tennis? You know, why bother unless you're actually going to get returns that can beat either the best of fund managers or or, or the index. So uh, I want to talk about uh, one share that uh, I've recently, or over the last year, built up a position in. Um, I think I own about 3.2 percent of Arkintech,、um, so I've got no motivation or incentive here of talking it up.、Um, The company was、uh, founded in 1979. It used to be known as Knowledge Technology Solutions. People might know it and remember it for that name and all the losses that came with it. I don't know if no, one, I won't ask anyone in the audience whether they're going to put their hands up to having admitted investing in the company at that time.、Uh, and what they do is that they provide independent and cost-effective alternative to market data infrastructure for both producers and consumers of real-time and non-real-time data. And what that means is. They have two effective offerings: one on the server side and one on the desktop side. On the server side, they offer solutions for receiving, processing, and distributing market data, both internally and exporting it externally, e.g., onto Bloomberg or, or other platforms. And the desktop software solution enables end users to receive, share, manipulate, and publish prices such as currency rates, bond yields, stock prices, etc. They've got a number of key products. The ones that I think have the most value going forward are Accelerator. This is an add, a, add a, an Excel add-in,、um, and also a desktop white label platform. Now, this white label platform allows large institutions, and you can see the caliber of its clients at the bottom there. It allows a、uh, one of those institutions to create effectively their own Reuters or Bloomberg. And what they have to do is the platforms pr- provided by Arkintech, but the companies have to go out and they have to get the data feeds to plug in. So it's the external data feeds that get plugged in. But often the companies themselves generate a lot of data. They be maybe the market for some of these obscure options and、uh, and bonds. And they get very resentful of the fact that they make the market, and yet they're pumping that data out. It goes to Bloomberg, and then their traders on another floor are then paying twenty-six thousand pounds per desk or whatever it is to receive that same information back. So they want to be able to、um, cut out the intermediary, I suppose, by just cutting out、uh, Reuters or, or whoever else might be offering the platform. And this is the share price performance.、Um, This was done a few days ago. Before I announced, I'd bought another 10,000 shares, and before I rather foolishly tweeted on uh, that I、uh, was going to be talking about Arkintech at this meeting, the shares I think are up about one pound fifty, one pound sixty. So the market cap's around one, about 20 million,、um, and you can see that it's、uh, come up a long way.、Uh, I started buying around 60, 70, 80 pence. Uh, and then I bought a few more at about 1:30, and a couple of days ago I bought another 15,000. When I got a call from the broker saying we've got a chunk of stock, do you want to buy it? You know, I, I did. I found out the next day that the seller was the non-exec director, the chairman, so I wasn't best pleased.、Um, right, this is、uh, our context historic sales and profits up to 2018. And you can see that this was a bit of a basket case, you know, in the early years, running up very significant losses. I mean, here, almost a million loss in 2010 on barely a million of revenue,、uh, and even by 2013, they were still making losses of four or five hundred thousand on turnover of a couple of million. And the current CEO, Matthew Jeffs, came in at that time, and he very quickly turned the company around. So they made a very small loss in 14 on improved turnover. And the last three years, he's grown turnover only by about eight percent per annum, but it's allowed the company, because of the operational gearing in the company, to expand its operating profits at a much faster rate. And you can see how they've built up quite significantly over the last few years. And you can see the operational gearing effect, particularly strongly in that period, 17 to 18, where profits are 
uh, of becoming a bigger part of overall sales. Now, what I've done is um, really extrapolated that data, and I've reflected in that extrapolation the point that in the H1 results for the current financial year, sales managed to increase from this 8% sort of bounded range that they were in to 13%. And that allowed the company to boost its operating profits by 90%. Now, the company said, actually, it's not really 90%, it's 41%, because we've actually had a provision in for some costs, which we've reversed. And if you ignore that reversal, you know, operating profits would have gone up by 41%, not the 90 Now, in all honesty, how many companies that we invest in would have been so honest as to point that out? They would have just reversed the provision and claimed credit for the 91% expansion. So that's, again, going into the culture and the mindset of the management here. I like that kind of thinking and that kind of uh, honest and prudent approach. So what I've done is uh, take, I've rolled forward those earnings, not... Uh, 13%, but I've upped it to 15%. Um, and then I've seen what the operational impact is on the financial models that, that, that I use. And you, operating margins end up getting to about 44% of turnover. Now, we'll have to see whether the business can cope with that level of operational gearing or whether there has to be step changes in the cost structure, which erode that 44%. And of course, this is illustrative only. There's plenty of health warnings I'm going to bring up. Where are they? Here they are. And it's worth noting that FinCap, who are the house brokers, take a much more cautious view in terms of what, what they think the value, uh, what they, where they think sales and profits are going. Uh, particularly, they only forecast out to 2020, and you can see that I'm as much as the 11% over on 2020 and as much as 29% over on my forecast for profits in 2020. So uh, we'll see, we'll see. You know, historically, I was always able to... to, to to guess or estimate Biovantics rather the better than the house broker. Let's see whether I've been able to do it again. Time will tell. Um, earnings per share. Now, earnings per share really went up through the roof in fact 2018, but that was partly because the deferred tax credit helped to boost earnings per share in that year. So uh, achieving that level, which is what I think is possible this year, uh, will be some achievement because really, uh, well, actually, really, the, the underlying profits were, were somewhere in the middle of those two bars for 17 and 19. Um, and you can see how earnings per share motor ahead under that scenario. The company's got a huge amount of tax losses, and based upon my extrapolation, those tax losses would, would be fully utilised by 2025, so we'd then start paying corporation tax, which is why the, profit, the earnings per share drop in that period. Now, let's look at all things cash. Uh, you can see that the company raised a lot of cash in the, in the 2000s. Uh, was losing money, obviously the cash was going down. But since then, cash has increased, and often the company is able to charge in advance for its services, uh, which uh, you know, is a great business. The business you want is a business that's financed by the suppliers and not by shareholders um, or banks. And you can see that free cash flow has been reversed and is very strong. Um, and that free cash flow to earnings conversion has been, except for the current year, has been actually close to over 100% or more in previous years. I think there was a one-off factor here, which meant that it rose to 200%, which is why free cash flow was lower in this year. But I think when we see the results for 19, we'll see a more consistent path. But this company can generate a lot of cash, and great, more cash is great. You know, dividends, special dividends, share buybacks, you know. That's what you want, to, you want to hear from a company. And let's look at returns on capital. Now, if we take returns on equity, they're now over 20% and rising. And I always think that ROE, return on equity, is a good advanced indicator of where the business is going. I remember the software business, NCC, uh, always did spectacularly well, but its returns on equity were declining. And then eventually they announced various profits warnings. So that's a very healthy trend. And then I use this measure called return on tangible assets, and I exclude acquired goodwill and acquired intangibles. But I do factor in the intangibles that they themselves put on their balance sheet because they shift cost, you know, whether it be software development or in the case of a biotech R&D. I do make management responsible for, for the performance of those assets. And the higher this rotor X, Sorry, the numerator there is adjusted operating profits. 
Uh, the higher the, the rotor X generally, the higher the cash generation long term in the business. Essentially, the, the company has limited assets over which it, which it needs to replace and return. So uh, what are the bull and the bear points? Well, the f bull points we've discussed. Firstly, significant operational leverage, um, strong balance sheet, very cash generative, the excellent CEO who turned around the business, uh, and products that are well entrenched with clients, um, and also a very strong product suite. And the core bull point, really, is the ability to sell accelerator and desktop into a key client. A key part of the success of Accelerate, of uh, Architect, will be really, is really dependent on, on that company's ability, the key client, to uh, accelerate and replace its existing data platform. Uh, so that is a key opportunity, it's also a key risk. Should add that uh, so far, that desktop offering has probably rolled out slower than I'd hoped. They have five companies trialing it, they have two clients, and the two clients have only added 70 desks so far. Um, you know, watch out for that number. If that number starts picking up, that's when you really want to, uh, you, you really will be, uh, you know, taking very little risk by buying, assuming the price is, is right. So what are the bare points? The sales cycle is long and complicated. It can take years to get stuff in. They only have the, the CEO and one other making the sale. Um, it's a very technical sell. It's a bit like with Biobentix, where it was the CEO who was effectively doing the marketing because he understood all the science. You can't just put a smooth salesman in this role. They've really got to understand how financial markets work. There's a reliance on the top three customers, and that's a big reliance, 56%, and that's balanced out by the fact that these products are so well integrated into their customers' systems. Um, as I've said, growth highly dependent on the key client and its ability to implement its strategy. And you know, I've got to mention the recent sale by the chairman. Um, he sold about 9% of his stake. I went back to the CEO, I said, what's happening? He pointed out that Richard Last, the chairman, had, uh, during the 2000s, put a lot of money in the company when it was losing a fortune uh, and, you know, wanted to take some of the money out. So, you know, I'm reminded of the fact that on Biobentix, I bought a chunk of shares from the CEO at £4.20 and then again at £6.60. I was very worried at the time. The shares are now £38, £39. So, you know, CEOs, chairmen, they all, and other NEDs, they all have their own reasons for selling. Uh, and, you know, it's always uncomfortable when you do see them selling. So, anyway, on that point, I think we might have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'll uh, pass it back to the floor. Hi. Just looking at what you did previously, you moved from being a value investor to being a growth investor, or more growthy. I'm just wondering how you made that transition. Um, well, a lot of reading, really. You know, and so getting reading around Warren Buffett and... Uh, in, the, in the 90s and sort of developed my thinking. Also, you know, I, you know, I was in corporate finance as well, so I could see that companies that had thin margins, you know, what, what, you know, you sometimes had a client that would say, I'm only paying nine times earnings, but there's, you know, you might easily better pick up a nine times earnings business that's generating a 5% margin, but the quality, the benefit of buying a, a business that has a 30% margin, which is demonstrating to you that that company has some economic superior econ economics and protection you know, is, is very, very powerful. And so I got frustrated in corporate finance because CEOs just didn't see that. You know, they, just want, they set a limit and they just wanted to stick to it. So, so it's partly down to re reading and experience on the corporate finance side that taught me that uh, value doesn't... Value in the, in, in the, in the sense that it's known, I cheap, generally is a, a bad idea. Um, but of course, in many ways, you know, people, real value is buying at a discount to intrinsic value. So, you know, if, if you, you can buy that at any spectrum, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's uh, um, Facebook and a very high multiple, if you can argue that that growth will continue, then it's good value, you know. Hi, Leon. 18-19% uh, oh, is not a good return. It's an excellent, outstanding return, and may will that continue. My question was, how have you changed as an investor and how do you expect to be changing as an investor? Uh -huh. Thanks. Well, I think the first part is probably already answered. Uh, what's, what's, I mean, I, I listed that I'd invested in 172 companies within my ISA. Uh, 
But for many years, it might have only been four shares or five shares. Even into 2010, 11, it was only 12 shares. You know, now it's up to 22, 23. Although overall, I've got about 40. So, what's happening is that I'm, I, I'm more nervous, and I'm not working any. I've given up corporate finance, so my opportunity to buy back in is more restricted if I make a big mistake. Uh, so I am becoming more cautious. Generally, I put my best stuff in my ISA and my SIP. Outside, I put the riskier stuff where I have maybe the benefit of capital gains, tax losses if I if I need to utilise them. Thank you, Leon. Leon Boris, thank you.